Julie Ryan, noted psychic and medical intuitive, is ready to answer your personal questions, even those you never knew you could ask. For more than 20 years, as she's developed and refined her intuitive skills, Julie used her knowledge as a successful inventor and businesswoman to help others. Now, she wants to help you grow, heal, and get the answers you've been longing to hear. Do you have a question for someone who's transitioned? Do you have a medical issue? What about your pet's health or behavior? Perhaps you have a loved one who's close to death and you'd like to know what's happening. Are you on the path to fulfill your life's purpose? No matter where you are in the world, take a journey to the other side and ask Julie Ryan. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. I'm Julie, your host, and I'm so delighted you could join us this week. My intention in doing this show is to provide information, insight, and comfort to people all around the world by helping to answer life's unanswerable questions. And I have this fabulous show lined up. This is going to play the week between Christmas and New Year's. I'm not doing a live show the day after Christmas, but boy, do I have a fun show lined up for you guys. You're going to want to listen to this whole thing because you're going to learn a lot. And I think it will be really fascinating, really interesting for you. So as I was preparing for this last show of 2019, I wondered why spirits, angels, and ghosts were prevalent in Christmas stories. The most famous story of all, the nativity, talks about an angel appearing to Mary to let her know she'd conceive a child. An angel appearing to the shepherds to let them know that Christ's child had been born. And an angel appearing to Joseph to tell him to go home via a different route because King Herod was killing male babies. And then we all know the famous Dickens Christmas Carol, published in 1843, about a snarky old man named Ebenezer Scrooge who was visited by the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. In recent years, many shows utilize the Christmas ghost theme. My fave, Downton Abbey, did a Christmas episode that featured a Ouija board that communicated a message from a dead character. And the Hallmark Channel has several Christmas movies depicting spirits and deceased loved ones showing up. It seems our fascination with ghostly tales around Christmas time goes back thousands of years and is rooted in ancient celebrations of the winter solstice. In the depths of winter, pagan traditions included a belief in a ghostly procession across the sky known as the Wild Hunt. The Germanic people celebrated a Yuletide festival during the Wild Hunt, and Yule logs were burned by the Celts during the winter solstice to ward off evil spirits. Likewise, the Victorians invented many familiar British Christmas traditions that have been emulated in America, including Christmas trees, cards, carols, and roast turkey. They also customized the winter ghost story, relating it specifically to the festive season. So, to help us make sense of the history of Christmas ghosts and spirits, my guest tonight is a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel named Curry Stegan, who happens to be a paranormal investigator. How perfect is that? Curry, welcome to the show. I'm so delighted that you're here. You're a Christmas present for me and for all of our listeners. So, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, Julie. It's a pleasure to be joining you on the show. We had you on my show a couple of months ago, and that was a lot of fun. And uh, so I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to being on this side of it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a different, uh, different perspective now that uh, I'm on your show. <laughs> exactly. Well, everybody, let me tell you a little bit about Curry. He's the host of Passion for the Paranormal podcast. He's been a paranormal investigator for over six years and is working on his first book, documenting his experiences as a paranormal investigator. So Curry... How does a military officer go from black and white, right versus wrong existence to become a paranormal investigator? What was your path on that? How did this happen? <laughs> well, yeah. Do they, have, do they have a lot of ghosts and stuff in the military? You know, I to be honest with you, Julie, I always kind of uh, have been a skeptic when it comes to ghosts and spirits. Uh, and uh, I would say probably the, the majority of my military career, that's kind of, that was the space I was in. Um, I've always, and you know, you know, we've talked about this before, I've followed the UFO phenomena for many years, uh, but I've also been open to the fact that, and I've had a lot of people talk about paranormal experiences they've had, friends, family members. I was, was always kind of curious because most of these people were fairly sane people that had experiences. 
I just never really could say that any of my experiences were truly paranormal. Uh, if you want to call having a UFO sighting a paranormal experience, I guess you could say from that perspective I did when I was uh, a young adolescent. Uh, but I really always had uh, a fascination with the fact that many others had had experiences that I'd known of and had heard about their experiences. And then uh, probably about 2004, 2005 time frame um, enters Ghost Hunters, the show. Yes. Right. And uh, I, you know, I had seen other shows in the past about the paranormal uh, and then Ghost Hunters comes out and I really, I really was impressed with their approach to the paranormal. Um, you know, they would go into a case and, you know, they would meet with the clients and kind of try to get a feel for what was going on there. Uh, but they also took a kind of an objective approach to a case in that they would go in and uh, they would not assume um, that the location was haunted and they let their evidence take them to their conclusion, if that makes sense. So uh, if, they, if they captured evidence and uh, we call evidence a lot of times, one of the biggest forms of evidence we get as paranormal investigators is uh, what we call electronic voice phenomena or EVPs. And that is essentially voices we capture on digital voice recorders that perhaps our ears don't hear. Maybe they're at a certain frequency, either low or high, that our ears don't pick up. But for some reason, these voice recorders, which are a little bit more sensitive, pick up. Um, and, you know, that's one of the biggest pieces of evidence, uh, at least as my experience as a paranormal investigator, that's about 90% of the evidence we capture. And, uh, you know, that's the, going back to the show Ghost Hunters, um, a lot of times that's the kind of evidence they would capture too. A lot of times it's in the audio form. But I was really impressed by their approach and, um, you know, that if they had no evidence of a haunting, uh, they went into a location, they would simply communicate that at the end of their investigation with the client. Um, however, there are a lot of others, and, you know, this is, this is of course, um, you know, we're talking about a TV show, and they have ratings and that sort of thing, but, I, but, but <laughs> you know, there's always that aspect of it, but I thought that their approach was pretty professional, and, and they tried to be objective as possible when they went into these, you know, these locations, and that kind of interested me. Uh, I had a sister-in-law who was working with a paranormal group and had had paranormal experiences in the past. And uh, she had kind of relayed to me and shared some of those stories with me. And uh, so I kind of, that, that's kind of how I got involved in the paranormal to begin with. Um, I went on a tour, uh, you want to call it a ghost tour. Um, uh, another paranormal group was putting on a tour. Uh, I, I live in northern Utah. I'm in the Ogden, Utah area. There was a paranormal group that was doing ghost tours. Uh, up in Brigham City at this old location, it was known as the Barren, um, the Barren Woolen Mill, and uh, it was a very historic location. Um, it was an old mill that uh, existed back at, way back, going all the way back to mid to late 1800s. And my wife and I took a chance and went on this ghost tour, and and we had a few strange experiences that that we couldn't explain, and. Uh, my sister-in-law had uh, asked me if I wanted to go as a guest on one of the investigations with the paranormal group she was working with. And I said, well, heck, why not? You know, and uh, had went on uh, an investigation as a guest with, uh, with that group. And a couple of other strange things happened uh, with me on that investigation. Uh, and so I would say a kind of you know, started as a little bit of a skeptic, although when I say skeptic, I wasn't the type of person that said, I don't think ghosts exist, and it was completely out of the question. I was just uncertain and kind of was interested in exploring it for myself. So I guess that's kind of how I got started, and then uh, after a couple of investigations as a guest with this group that my sister-in-law was working with, I kind of got pulled in and before I knew it, I was a member in training and working with the group, and and there I was going on investigations. And, uh, you know, more and more experiences just, you know, kind of solidified it more for me. And now, you know, I'm, I'm really a, a firm believer that 
you know, there's, there's something that happens to us after we die and that uh, perhaps spirits are interacting with us and can sometimes communicate with us. So I guess of the well, short of it, that's kind of how. I do that all day long, <laughs> you know, during the work week. So I can tell you, yeah, you know, there's been every day, there are many, many instances of things that there's no way I would know that are, that are validated and corroborated by the people with whom I'm working or, or we can corroborate historical information with documents online, historical documents online. And, and I find it interesting that you're talking about the digital recorder because when we see a photograph, or oftentimes it's a family photograph, there can be orbs in the photograph. And people have said mostly, well, there was something screwy with the light. No, it's a spirit. It's just that the digital cameras are picking it up. And so they'll send me these pictures or these photographs and they'll say, can you identify who that is? And I'll say, yeah, that's dead aunt Clara. And that's your, you know, your uh, dead whoever. And it's pretty interesting who shows up in those pictures. There was a picture taken of my family at my son, Jonathan's eighth grade graduation. And there was a big orb over my younger brother's heart. And it was my grandmother, my deceased grandmother. So I can tell who it is by looking at those. So, well, from the beginning of time, you know, every civilization, every religion, every culture references ghosts, spirits, angels, whether or not a person believes in this, like you're a great example, you're skeptical. Well, that's appropriate. People say to me, well, I'm skeptical. I don't know if I believe this. And I say, well, that's appropriate. And then sometimes people say, well, you need to prove this to me. And I say, no, really, I don't. If you're interested, fine. If you're not, that's fine too. That's your prerogative. I don't really care. You know, you're entitled to your beliefs. It doesn't have an effect on me one way or the other. Sure. Uh, but, but, you know, when a person knows about these entities, whether they believe, it, believe in them or not, it seems like since the beginning of time, in the hieroglyphics from the ancient Egyptians and the cave dwellers and certainly through you know, through the Middle Ages and, and in all the Holy Scriptures, regardless of who their religion is, it, it talks about spirits and angels and ghosts. Why do you think that is? What do you think's going on with that? Yeah, I, and that, that is interesting because you've touched on something here. It seems like all cultures and religions have reference to, to spirits and ghosts. And uh, you go back to ancient Roman times and, you know, and even before Christianity, this has been oh. recorded. Right. Native Americans were very, very spiritual and, and uh, you know, did go. Still down. are. Yeah, and, st yeah. and still are. Still That's are. Yeah. I had a hawk sitting on my deck today. I posted it online, a picture, and this hawk comes and he hangs out. I think it's a female because it's not as big. I think it's a bigger one than I've seen, and it just it just hangs out on my deck. It's a riot, and they're supposedly spiritual messengers in the indigenous culture, especially the American Indians. I mean, they're all about the hawks and the eagles and the, you know, all that being spiritual messengers. Yeah, absolutely, and that that's what's interesting is you go back and you see that this is prevalent throughout different cultures. Go like you said, you know, I mentioned ancient Greece and Rome, and even going back to ancient Egypt, and uh, now what they believed as far as what happens when you pass on and how that happens, you know, there's obviously a lot of variation based on religion and cultural beliefs and that sort of thing. But the bottom line is they all believed in some sort of afterlife. Right. Pretty much all cultures and religions, I mean, going all the way back to ancient times, all had some sort of belief in, uh, you know, an afterlife and, uh, you know, how, you move into the afterlife, that's a little bit different for different cultures, but there all seems to be that common thread that, you know, there is an afterlife and, and perhaps at times we can interface with um, spirits, ghosts, whatever you want to call them. And there seems to be that common thread throughout cultures. And well, that's what I talk about in my book, Angelic Attendance, what really happens as we transition from this life into the next. And when I was researching the what I call the 12 phases of transition that I see, Curry, that is how angels and deceased loved ones surround somebody as they're dying, I, I was reminded of a prayer. I was raised Roman Catholic, and I go to a Catholic church now, and we're practicing Catholic. And 
and I there's a prayer set at the end of every Catholic funeral called In Paradisum. And it talks about the angels and your loved ones will greet you and lead you into paradise. And so when I was researching my book, best I could find was that it originated as a fifth century Gregorian chant. And I have to believe that since the beginning of time, people have been able to see, I'm doing air quotes, see in their mind's eye what I see when somebody's transitioning. And Perhaps it took until the fifth century till somebody was, people were well educated enough that they could read and write and write down something that correlates with what they see. And certainly back then, the most learned people were men and they were in monasteries and synagogues. They were the keepers of the holy records and, and all of the, look at, look at all the, the Vatican library, my goodness, the stuff they have in there dating back from gosh, in lots and lots of years in antiquity. So, so I think that we've been able to see these things and, and perceive them. And as we've become more well-educated and we have access to digital voice recorders and cameras and <laughs> things like that, you know, we, we've become more scientific based and we want to see proof for things. But do you think that all of this belief in the afterlife and with the spirits and the ghosts and all that, is that a way that you, that perhaps cultures and religions talk to their civilizations about the afterlife to just say, Hey, there's more to it than this. Yeah. Do you, and think, I, you think it was a teaching thing that started out as a teaching thing? Perhaps. Um, I would say probably, the I, I would probably take exception to that with the Chris, Christian faith, and uh, and the reason you why would? I would because of the fact that uh, there is this teaching that you either go to one place or the other uh, when we pass on, and uh, you know there are references in the Bible to spirits and uh, you know go all the angels way back and to angels and that sort of thing. But there's also this notion that if you if you pass on, you either go one of two places. And if you are seeing something ghostly or you, you are seeing something spiritual, perhaps that could be demonic and we are being perhaps led astray. And uh, so I would say from a Christianity, Christianity perspective or Christian perspective, um, there, there is that that aspect to it uh, that, you know, if you are, uh, you know, even going back to the New Testament, uh, if you are <laughs> seeing a ghost, if you are communing with spirits, uh, perhaps that is something demonic. And, uh, and, and that's something, you know, that as, as, a, as a Christian, if you are a traditional Christian, that is something that I think is, to a certain degree, that is a little bit of a uh, a challenge to anybody who wants to believe in spirits and ghosts and and that sort of thing because there is that fundamental belief that if you are experiencing this perhaps you are not truly experiencing some a dead person that's moved on but perhaps you are experiencing something else perhaps demonic that sort of thing so I think you have that aspect of it but you do have other religions and cultures that I think are, are a little bit different in that aspect to, you know, even Buddhism is a little bit more open, I think, to the spiritual uh, aspect of it that, you know, perhaps we are able to commune with, uh, with dead people and spirits. But, you know, the whole, we're talking about Christmas and, and uh, you know, Jesus, and that's a whole reason we celebrate Christmas. I mean, Jesus in and of himself performed miracles and supernatural and paranormal feats and acts. I mean, right. uh, walking on water. I mean, <laughs> that is a, that is something that is a supernatural act. I mean, he healed sick people and healed the blind and, you know, brought people's sight back and, and, uh, these sorts of things were going on. Uh, when he was walking on water, the apostles thought he was a ghost, <laughs> Right. <laughs> you right. know, and, and uh, yeah, it's, so it's, it's interesting. And then he raised Lazarus from the dead. So, you know, another paranormal event or supernatural event. Good point. Uh, Good point. Yeah. As far as all of that with Christianity, I think people are so conditioned to think, oh, my God, when, I've, when I die, am I going to fly or am I going to fry? 
kind of a right. thing. And, and I think what's what we're finding in this day and age, at least has been my experience, is that uh, a lot of that is hell and demonic and all of that. To me, it's just all fake news. It's all been used to control the masses by civilizations and religions throughout history. Because what's the greatest motivator for people? It's fear. And sure. so interestingly enough, my book, Angelic Attendance, is being used as curriculum in Sunday school classes around the country. It's being oh, wow. used in synagogues. And my parish, my church, gives it out to every family that comes in to plan a funeral. So I think we're starting to accept it more and accept that, okay, that doesn't really exist. I don't believe it exists. I believe that all spirits are pure love and light, limitless love. And uh, so that demonic thing doesn't exist it is my belief. And, and it's hard to change that paradigm when we've been so inundated with it over time. And, and uh, it's interesting watching it evolve, I find. And more and more people, when people ask me what I do, I tell them that I'm a uh, I'm a businesswoman and an inventor who learned how to do woo-woo. <laughs> and they say, what? It's kind of like the Scooby-Doo cartoon, you know, when Scooby would tilt his head and go, oh, all right, what? <laughs> and, and then and the, the reason I say that is because it disarms them, first of all. And if they want to know more, they'll ask another question. Like, okay, what does that mean? And I'll say, well, I'm a psychic and a medical intuitive. And then I just shut up. And then they say, well, what does that mean? And invariably, if they get into a conversation with me about it, they're interested. It's not just something that, it's just not something that they talk about, you know, in normal conversation. But pretty much everybody has an interest, whether they believe it or not. There's a part of them that says, hmm, maybe there is something to this. What is, what if there is something to this? I'm on the board at the University of Arizona to a, a research project by uh, uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz, and he has come up with technology that can communicate with spirit. And he's getting ready to write a paper on it and introduce it. It will be a big old game changer with that. So I will keep you posted on that, and everybody that's listening, I'll, I'll keep you posted on that as well. But it's it's pretty exciting that someone who's a tenured professor from Yale or the University of Arizona poached him from Yale and got him to come down there to do his research. And he has a big lab set up and he has all these tech guys and electrical engineers and sound engineers and all this other jazz. And they've come up with equipment that can communicate with spirit. And he shows a 99.9% .9 accuracy rate wow. in communicating with spirit. So I know you'll be interested in, in hearing more about that. Absolutely. But back to the Christmas, back to the, yeah, I'll keep you posted. Back to the Christmas theme. Um, do you think that the pagan winter solstice ceremonies, I, I did some research and I found that they date back to the caveman days in 10,000 BC. That was a long time ago. But why do you think there's these stories are so prevalent, especially at Christmas time? Is it because it, it's the families are together and they can explore this stuff that it's what's your take on that yeah that's that's interesting because uh as i was gathering with family last year on christmas eve they know i'm a paranormal investigator and sure enough they wanted to hear some stories and sure. uh you know, we got into ghost stories. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, it's a time of gathering. It's it's a time of celebration. And, you know, you mentioned Yule and, you know, all these ancient celebrations. It's interesting how we took uh, the birth of Jesus. You know, I don't think anybody could argue that we really truly know when Jesus was born. Um, it probably wasn't around Christmas time, but it, it's oh. kind of like the Romans took these ancient traditions and married them with Christianity. And perhaps that's how they were able to can, to get some of these people that were, some may refer as, to as pagans. The pagan holidays, absolutely. The pagan, the pagan holidays. Festivals. Yeah. yeah. The winter solstice is December 25th. Yeah. And, and absolutely. And, you know, that was maybe perhaps one way they were able to kind of take two different, um, two different 
you know, people, two different types of people, Christians, pagans, and kind of make them into, you know, a, a unified society, if you will. You know, they took some of these traditions, these ancient celebrations, and, you know, we, we now have Christmas. We celebrate around the winter solstice time. It's interesting so that how that happened. But the interesting thing is we're, we're gathered together with family and we're celebrating. And, uh, you know, it, it seems like a time when if we have loved ones that have passed on, it certainly seems like a, a normal time for them to want to come by, drop by and say hello. Uh, when we're, you know, we're, we're together with family and friends and you know, celebrating. What a time. What, I can't think of a better time when they would want to maybe pop in and say hello. And uh, perhaps, you know, let, let others know that they're okay and uh, that uh, they're here with us. Uh, interesting story. Um, I don't have a lot of um, stories to share about spirits and at least not my own experiences, but we had a friend of ours uh, a couple of years back, her brother passed away and uh, it just happened to be over Christmas time that, uh, you know, she had family over and such and she's kind of maybe not to your abilities, maybe you might call her an empath, mm -hmm. um, a sensitive but she just felt the presence of her brother there. And, uh, you know, she didn't see him, but she felt like he was there and she started snapping photos and uh, right around the Christmas tree in different areas where she kind of felt maybe he was there. And uh, she, she sent us a photo um, or a couple of photos that she had snapped. And one kind of looked like this misty type um, white, um, appar almost like an apparition or like an ectoplasm, whatever you want to call it, um, appearing right there by the Christmas tree. And uh, so she's like, she knew I was a paranormal investigator. She's like, what do you think of this? Um, you know, and, and of course my brain wants to go to, well, you know, maybe it's the lighting, you know, maybe there's, <laughs> you know, we're always looking for, we like to say we're always looking for the normal before we find the paranormal. But, you know, looking at the photo itself, it, uh, you know, it was hard to say that there was some logical explanation for what it was there. And it was just interesting because she felt the presence, her mom felt the presence of her brother there uh, during the holiday period. Um, I had another coworker, uh, former coworker, share a story with me. Uh, and it was in a whole old house that she lived in. Um, her mother had passed away several years back. She kept hearing, and they had wooden floors, very creaky wooden floors in this house, and she kept hearing somebody walking around at night when her sons were in bed and she was asleep, and, um, you know, she'd get awoken by this noise of somebody walking around, and on occasion, doors opening and closing, um, and then her son, who was probably about five, six years old at the time, later relayed to her that he thought he had saw his grandma in his room and uh she had already uh felt she didn't see it but she felt a presence in her room as well what she thought was perhaps her mother kind of looking over her but then her son had relayed that to her that he thought he saw his his dead grandma in his bedroom and so some of this activity was happening over the holiday period so kind of interesting you wonder if she was kind of you know visiting and looking over him you know, during that holiday time period. So just a couple of anecdotal stories of, of, of things people have shared with me. Well, spirits to me, uh, Curry, look like beam me up Scotty in Star Wars, Star Trek, you know, where they're, they're beaming them up to a different planet or a different ship or whatever, how they turn into a hologram of themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's how they appear to me, animals as well deceased animals do and when i'm in the presence of a ghost i don't i don't really feel any differently although the first time i was standing in a room and a ghost opened the door and walked through the a ghost spirit this was a, this was a ghost walked through the doorway and i 
watched the door open. I was with a friend. I talk about this in my book. <laughs> I watched the door, but I was like, holy moly, what the heck is this? And, and it was this woman that walked in in turn of the 20th century dress. And she had on a long velvet skirt and a velvet short jacket and a high collar white blouse and her, a hat and her hair was in a Gibson girl updo and and she told me what her name was and told me what she was doing. But that was the first time I'd experienced that. Normally, when I talk to deceased loved ones or talk to whomever, you know, we can, whoever you want to talk to, Mother Teresa, Einstein, Napoleon, it doesn't matter. You know, we can talk to whoever you want and we just pull them in. And the minute you say their name, they're right there. So anybody you want to talk to, that's what we did when I was on your show and you want to talk to JFK. We just pulled him in. He was standing to your right. That's where they always stand when I see him. But I find that there's a difference between spirits and ghosts. Do you feel that there's a difference? I'll explain how I perceive it. But what's your perception of that? Well, that's interesting because uh, I think some would say perhaps a spirit is somebody who's passed on that maybe they're onto that other realm. Um, and maybe a ghost would be somebody who's, you know, they passed on, but they haven't truly passed on. Perhaps they're still on this earthly plane in some way, shape, or form. And maybe as we're paranormal investigators, we're going out investigating these locations. Maybe that's who, you know, from time to time, we somehow are interfacing with them. Um, it, uh, that's kind of what I would see as the difference. Um, uh, but sometimes I think they're kind of used interchangeably. Some people don't even, and, and I've talked to paranormal investigators that don't even like the word ghost. Um, and feel like there's a lot of baggage associated with that word. Um, but to me, that maybe that's the difference to me. I, and and I, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's different from, from the way you would uh, describe them. Spirits are in heaven, what we would call heaven, which is non-physical. Ghosts are in non-physical as well, but they have unfinished business. So when we're in non-physical, physical, we can be in countless places at the same time. So that's when spirits tell me, well, this is great because I can be with my whole family everywhere they are all at the same time. And it's hard for us to wrap our human minds around that. But I hear that a lot, that this is, gosh, this is great from somebody that's just died. And it's all pure bliss. The difference is... In spirit form, they think of something and it immediately, they have it. They think of a hot fudge sundae and they have it. They think of exploring the ancient pyramids in Egypt and they, they have it. They do it. It's kind of like, did you watch the TV show Bewitched when you were growing up? And yeah. that was one of my favorite shows. And I remember thinking, oh, I want to be like Samantha Stevens when I grow up. And now I am. <laughs> She, whoever whoever wrote the screenplay of that TV series, Curry, I think knew about Woo Woo because she would think of her mother and Dora, and Dora would immediately come show up. She would think of Uncle Arthur, and he would show up. She would want to be in Chicago on a shopping trip, and she would wiggle her nose, and she'd be there. She'd snap her fingers, and she'd be there. And that's called non-local reality, which I do, and I teach people in my class to do all of this, communicate with spirit do non-local reality, all of this. But the interesting thing about ghosts is that they seem to have unfinished business. And when I talk with them, I can find out what it is. Normally, I will ask them to go into the light. Sometimes I bring in other family members who are deceased that are there to greet them, that bring them into the light. But I have so many stories about things that have happened like that. My daughter-in-law, Mallory, her grandmother had her two daughters, Mallory's mother and her aunt in her kitchen fixing Christmas dinner one time. And they were all in her kitchen and she had antique spoons and stuff like that, like big serving spoons hanging on the wall. All three of them watched these spoons come up off the wall, come out from the wall and fall on the counter. Nobody was near them. I mean, it was just like somebody invisible was doing that. And so, of course, they're on the phone with me the next day. This is before Jonathan and Mallory were married. 
there on the phone with me going, what the heck was that? <laughs> and so I did, I can do an instant replay. And I kind of like, I, if you're watching a TV football game on TV, you know, they're doing an instant replay of the touchdown. Right. So I did an instant replay of what happened. And I found a, a family. It was three men and one was a Confederate soldier. It was here in Birmingham is where this happened. And it was a Confederate soldier and his father and his brother. Well, the Confederate soldier was dressed in his uniform. You'd be interested in this, being a military guy. And he was looking for his daughter, his little daughter. So he was killed in the war and he was looking for his daughter, but he didn't know he was dead. So I brought the daughter's spirit in and they went into the light. Well, before they did, I got the family name. I got that there was a farm on the property that the housing development is currently on. And one of the grandsons was able to corroborate the family name as the original deed holder of the land. Wow. And they were able to get information that it was a farm. And Mallory's grandmother said that they had, when they were putting in their gardens, that they had found old antique garden tools that had been buried that were from the time of the Civil War. So that's wow. just one story of things happening like that. I see vortexes at times that people would call a portal. Have you looked into that at all? Have you investigated that? Um, a little bit. Uh you know, that there are some investigators, uh, paranormal investigators that I tell you they know how to locate them. Uh -huh. um, I do. I, I have no idea how they're able to do that unless it is kind of along the lines of what you do. And uh, perhaps they have people in the group that have this kind of psychic abilities to do that. Um, I've always been fascinated by it. I always wonder, are there certain areas where there seems to be kind of this thinning of the veil, if you will, um, places like Skinwalker Ranch here, just in the Uena Basin here in Utah, where all kinds of strange activity. Happens. What's Skinwalker Ranch? I thought you meant Skywalker Ranch, like <laughs> you know, George Lucas. What's no. Skinwalker Ranch? Uh, well, Skinwalker Ranch is a place here. Again, it's in the Uena Basin near Duchesne, Utah, and it's a. Uh, and I don't remember how big this this uh, this uh, piece of land is, and uh, there's a lot of. Um, there, there's a lot of information that uh, the Utes and uh, and I'm trying to think of the other. It was the Utes and perhaps the Navajos that were kind of warring over this piece of land. And uh, and I don't remember if it was the Navajos or the Utes had cursed the land. And the um, Utes are an Indian tribe, right? Yes. A lot of people don't know that. Yes. That aren't so, from your area. Yeah, they're right. like the Cherokees or the Nav Navajo or the Sioux, or it's just a different. What, different tribe is that what you would call it what would you call it different yeah yes absolutely different tribe that were very prevalent in uh you know north just in utah in general along with the navajo and uh so there was a there was a a couple that bought this piece of land and you know they they had a ranch there and there was all kinds of strange paranormal activity happening um they saw not only and this is where it really gets weird um, lights in the sky, craft, um, followed by strange paranormal activity, um, strange creatures witnessed, um, anywhere from Bigfoot type creatures to strange dogman type creatures. Um, two of their pets were killed um, as they followed this strange beam of, or, or orb of light and chased it out into the darkness. Um, and they brought in government researchers to study this area. And uh, they all came away with it, scratching their heads going, whatever's here seems to be one step ahead of us, first of all. Second of all, um, I mean, these are PhD level researchers, some of these people that came in and studied this area. Um, there was reference to some sort of strange vortex looking um, interdimensional kind of tunnel, if you will, where some strange creature came out of it. Uh, and it, it's really, if you, if you ever get a chance to look into it, pretty much anything and everything paranormal has happened there. Um, very, very strange stuff. And then I had another guest on the show, um, Stan Gordon. And uh, there is an area in Pennsylvania 
Uh, and I'm trying to, my memory's not, uh, is not serving me well right now. Uh, Chestnut Ridge, the, an, an area ch called Chestnut Ridge, and it really runs from Southern Pennsylvania all the way down into West Virginia, but they've had all kinds of strange activity going on, kind of along the same lines as Skinwalker. UFO sightings, Bigfoot type creatures, um, strange dogman like creatures and some of the stuff has happened where they see craft and Bigfoot type creatures and other strange paranormal type activity going on and being reported across different counties in the same time frame, the same night. Uh, he had so many reports that he had to hire multiple investigators and they could just not, they just couldn't keep up with it. Um, and so these kind of areas, you have to wonder, is there some sort of, you said vortex, is there some sort of, Sedona, Arizona is another popular. Yeah, Santa Fe. Uh, yeah. Too. Santa yeah. Fe, New Mexico, right? In that another area? I've heard uh, a few things about Santa, Santa Fe as well, but it, it makes you wonder, is there some sort of areas, um, some people say, you know, there are areas where ley lines cross. Um, where there's all this kind of strange activity going on, and it seems to be in, in Skinwalker Ranch, just seems to be one of them where all kinds of different sort of strange things are happening. Are there areas, you know, locations uh, along the earth where there just seems to be some sort of vortex or something, some sort of thinning of, uh, you know, our world and other worlds, perhaps, where this stuff is going on? Um, and well, I see vortexes when there's a portal and it looks like a tunnel. It looks like a vortex that's a tunnel. I have a friend in Nashville and, and I have a, 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 I call it my room. It's her guest room, but I call it my room. And I, and she, her housing development is built on an old plantation. And in her backyard, in the corner of her backyard is a, a, foundation of what was originally a chapel and there are a bunch of graves around it and there are graves on the inside of the fence the stone wall and there are graves on the outside of the stone wall so I went up and I did a instant replay of what it was and it was a church little chapel that the townspeople and the people that worked on the plantation would come to and the people that were on the outside of the stone wall, you know, this is Tennessee, for God's sakes, they were the slaves and the servants. And then the people on the inside were the family. So when I'm in that guest room at her house, I see people in Sunday dress at the turn of the century in the late 1800s walking on a path. And I know they're headed to church because they're in their Sunday best. They do that. Speaking of Sedona, when I was in Sedona, I've been there several times and it's beautiful. But people say, oh, you're going to feel, there's just this special feeling about Sedona. I didn't so much notice that. But what I noticed, though, Curry, were there these little vortexes of energy, like little dust devils that are all over the basin there in Sedona. And I, I find it interesting that all of this UFO stuff, and I, I know they were versed in a lot of that as well, that that you had mentioned to me when I was on your show that there are a lot of former military people and government officials that are trying to get information declassified on UFO stuff. I, I have a friend who's a retired Air Force colonel who was a fighter pilot. And I've asked him what time I said, did you ever go to Area 51? And he said, no. I said, what do you think about it? He said, all I know is they tell you if you come anywhere near it, you'll be shot down. I mean, it's just like forbidden. You cannot go anywhere near it. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that and a little bit about that information being declassified and why. What, what's the point of declassifying it? Well, you know, it's interesting because if you look at the polls nowadays, it's well over in the last poll I seen regarding uh, what the public thinks about what the government knows on the UFO issue. Uh, if my memory serves me, it was about 68% that believe the government is covering this up and not telling the truth of, about the UFO phenomena. So um, I would say the majority of people now are opening their eyes to this. And, 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 and I think most people at this point, they're like, well, the government's not coming out and saying, you know, 
there's UFOs, uh, we can't control our skies. And, and, and maybe there's a good reason for that. I mean, some, some of the reasons you think about in terms of, you know, them not wanting to come out and say, yeah, these things are operating with impunity over our skies. It's probably not something they want to come out and just publicly say. Um, it would be however, too scary. People would yeah. be wigged out, don't you think, about it? Yeah, and yeah, I think like, like the you know the Will Smith was at Independence Day when they had their fighter <laughs> they were over their fighter jets and they were shooting down the the aircraft that was coming in the UFO aircraft. Yes, absolutely. And uh, however, I think. There's just too much inertia now. There's too many investigators out there. And now you've got Tom DeLong's effort to the STARS Academy, and he's got a lot of former government insiders working with him that are – they're the ones that were the reason why these Navy uh, um, gun camera footage videos got released. Uh, you know, they were playing on Fox News and CNN – of uh, and uh, Commander. So, David, describe what those were for those who ha those of us who haven't seen them and aren't familiar with them. Well, there's uh, there's two uh, different sets of videos that have been released publicly now, and one of them was back in 2004. The USS Nimitz Carrier Battle Group was off doing some uh, workups, getting ready to deploy. And uh, they were tracking, they were actually in an exercise, and Demand Commander David Fraber has told this story on numerous shows. He was on Joe Rogan's podcast fairly recently. He was the squadron commander of uh, this F-18 squadron. They were out doing workups, and they got vectored to, uh, they basically terminated the, def the um, defensive exercise that they were doing and said, we have a real-world vector. What does that and mean to a civilian? So basically, they You're got... You're talking Air Force, talk to us. Talk to us in English. <laughs> so they, they essentially got tasked to go look at, um, to, to, they got a new, um, basically a new direction, said, fly over in this part of this airspace and tell us what you're seeing, more or less. And so they did. They got uh, tasked, I guess, basically by their air, air, air traffic controllers or, or whatever their controllers to fly over to a different piece of airspace and monitor what was going on. They were seeing something on radar. Uh, the USS Princeton was tracking several targets um, of unknown origin, um, and uh, this has also become public. And uh, so Commander David Fravor and uh, his, his wingmen, um, you know, are vectored to this new location, and they, they start tracking this unknown target. Um, and it's basically, you know, he's, he's got gun camera footage uh, of him tracking this UFO. And uh, he's, he's following it. He's tracking it. I want to say he was about 20,000 feet up. And this can thing. He, can he see a, some kind of a, an aircraft or does it just look like it's an energy blob on his radar screen? What is he seeing? So they are referring to this as the Tic Tac UFO because it was shaped like a Tic Tac. No apparent markings on it. He's tracking this thing and uh, suddenly just out of, the, out of the blue, this thing just vanishes off of his radar. And you're talking about highly sophisticated radar system on these FA-18s that are tracking this you know, he's tracking this thing and suddenly, um, you know, probably over 10,000 miles an hour, this thing just takes off and disappears. And, uh, of course, his first thought is, wow, I want to fly that thing. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, and, but it's gone. I mean, it's just absolutely gone. And you, uh, Oh, now you're back. Wait, wait. Lost you for a sec, sorry. Okay, lost you for a second. Okay, and then what happened? So, so he, he so he van so it vanishes. Yeah, just absolutely vanishes off of his uh, radar screen, uh, out of the blue. In within the matter of probably a split second, it's gone. Wow. And uh, he also said this thing was maneuvering around, um, doing right angle turns that just defied the laws of physics. So. Um, you know, he's a smart fighter pilot guy. He's a squadron commander. He's, you know, been flying for better part of 20 years. 
he knows what an enemy aircraft looks like, and this thing is not anything he's ever seen before. And it didn't engage him in any way, right? No. It was and, just kind of flying around, and he was seeing it. Yes. And it looked like a Tic Tac, the mint, a Tic Tac. Is that yes. what you're talking about? Yes. Huh. And, so kind of an oval shape. Yes, kind of an oval shaped, like like a Tic Tac. Um and so this thing just disappeared. But again, the USS Princeton, which is part of the carrier battle group, is tracking these targets. And uh, I don't remember the individual's name, the radar operator. He's now came forward and said, yeah, we had over 100 of these things that were, Interesting. They were tracking. And where were they stationed? Where were they, where were they doing their maneuvers? Uh, this was off the coast of San Diego. Okay. So that was the first one. And then a 2015, another carrier battle, battle group was tracking another UFO target. Um, and the same kind of thing. The, it's on the gun camera footage. The pilot's got this thing on his radar. He's tracking it. And the next thing you know, this thing is just gone. Right. And that was in uh, the same area off of the coast of San Diego? This was off the East Coast. Okay. And so this is 20, so go back 2004 to the first incident. The second one was 2015. And uh, so both of these videos have been made public. Uh, CNN, Fox News has talked about them. David Fravor has been interviewed by, um, you know, multiple news agencies. Uh, it, it's been all over the press. And I think a lot more and more people are hearing about it and it's coming to light. Um, and more or less, this program they refer to as ATIP, which is the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, which this guy, Louis Elizondo, ran. Uh, he, he actually ran this program for DIA. He's now part of Tom DeLong's uh, organization to the STARS Academy. Uh, and uh, they worked, apparently they were the big driving factor in getting these videos released. And so, um, you know, it, it is big news, supposedly more is coming, um, but that's kind of in a nutshell what, the, what this is about. And uh, so far, that's kind of been the big news with To The Stars Academy and, and uh, you know, what they've been able to accomplish so far. There's an interesting point that I read about um, Werner von Braun, who was part of the German scientists that came over after World War II and they settled in Huntsville, Alabama and developed the NASA program and got, got us to be in the moon race and got Neil Armstrong to be the first one on the moon and all of that. And, and what we depict as a flying saucer back from the 50s, which was this kind of a saucer with a dome on it with a little green man flying in it. And, and there were pictures supposedly of that. And I've read several of Von Braun's biographies about him and his autobiography and fascinating guy brilliant guy but he claims that when he was in Germany that we know that half of the scientists came to America and the other half went to Russia and one of his colleagues who went to Russia was developing a device that looked like this what we think of as a flying saucer and it was a, a, a like a intelligence kind of a thing it was out doing recon and he said i've seen that design because my colleague just had it when we were in germany and and working for the the nazis and so that was an interesting little tidbit of information well i think certainly this is feasible because what it, in our galaxy alone we have a billion other galaxies or something or in our and then there are a billion planets in each galaxy or some crazy number like that. What are those numbers? Yeah, it's hard to even wrap your head around it because, uh, you know, and I don't know the exact numbers, but yeah, billions of stars in our own galaxy um, and planets. And, you know, it's pretty inconceivable that there's not other intelligent life out there. And perhaps if you look at and you believe that, you know, you kind of follow the big bang type theory I, I i don't know if we're talking 15 billion years somewhere around that neighborhood uh, perhaps in our i mean some i think say our galaxy's fairly young or you know maybe there's other galaxies out there where civilizations are a million years ahead of us well i had a guy call into one of my early shows the first year i did it and he's an engineer and he wanted me to do a past life 
deal with him. So I did, and his question was, was I an engineer in any past life? And so I, I got a past life that came up, and it looked like the set of Star Wars. It looked like these towers with these flying vehicles, and it looked like the set of a Star Wars movie. And I said, you were in charge of the power grid. And I, and I got, this must be a future life. I thought it was 1930-something. It was a past life on a different planet that was way more sophisticated than what we are. And I got that he was in charge of the power grid for, for the whole town or city or what compound, whatever you want to call it. And I said to him, what kind of engineer are you? And he said, I'm an electrical engineer. And I said, well, of course you are. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, in a past life, you were an electrical engineer and you wanted to come and experience what it was like in this lifetime. But certainly I, it's feasible and I've seen it a few times, not a whole lot, but I've seen it a few times that people have had past lives on different planets. And that gets really fascinating too when we get to there so back to the back to the spirit and christmas and ghost theme i think that who knows maybe the whole concept of spirits and ghosts came from elsewhere outside of the earth and that's how the cavemen certainly there are all kinds of drawings in caves but way before people were literate of this type of phenomenon so maybe it did come from a different different solar system or a different you know star trek enterprise maybe has <laughs> discovered it in a movie or something so well thank you so much for being with me on this special christmas show always fascinating to get to talk with you i wanted to introduce all of my listeners to you because you're such a fascinating guy thank you for your service and thank you, thank you for your take on a lot of this i'm sure that we all learned things that we hadn't thought of with this <laughs> and interestingly enough my new book angel messages for kids by the time this show airs it will be available so go to askjulieryan.com and you'll be able to see it angel messages for kids it's a picture book and it's really sweet and it talks about how can i how can my three-year-old know all this information about my grandmother who he says comes to visit her when i can't see her or communicate with her you to, to, to reference a story you told earlier and you know and other such phenomenon like that like how do I know past how's my child know past life stuff he can't even read yet how does my how do I explain to my little girl that she can see grandma's body in the casket but she can't you know she, we we're saying grandma's in heaven how do you explain that to them so how can people find you curry where's the best way for them to find you in your show well, they can start by going to my website, which is at passion, the number four, the paranormal.com. You can catch up with past episodes there. Um, you can find uh, links to for books, just like your book. Uh, past guests have been on the show. Yeah. Uh, I cover everything on the show. UFOs, uh, you know, I've had uh, people like you, psychics, mediums. You know, I've covered, I've had Bigfoot authors on the show and Bigfoot researchers, uh, right, right. you name it. Uh, right. Pretty much everything covered there on the show, anything paranormal okay. and unexplained. So, Well, yeah, there's my alarm. We got a boogie. But <laughs> everybody have a wonderful rest of the holiday. We'll do a live show next week on Thursday on January 2nd. And Curry, thank you so much for being on. And happy holidays and Merry Christmas to you and your family. And happy holidays to you. Thank you so much, Julie. It's you bet. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Julie on Twitter at Ask Julie Ryan and like her on Facebook at Ask Julie Ryan. For information on how you can ask Julie your question, please visit AskJulieRyan.com.